Okay, welcome to this section on performance in the Julia programming language. Now, this is a, an important topic for probably a lot of you that start looking at uh, the Julia programming language because one of the main benefits to go with Julia is that you can have dynamic language that has high performance. So to actually get that performance, you don't get that just automatically by simply writing Julia code. You have to understand a bit about how Julia works to actually get that kind of performance. So this first part, we're going to look at compilation. So what the Julia just-in-time compiler does when it generates native machine code. And then in the next video, we're going to look at abstract and concrete types that I showed you how you can create earlier, but we're going to talk about their relation to performance in Julia. And then finally, the, the last video is going to be about a very important subject in Julia, which is type stability. And you really need to understand that if you're going to avoid getting poor performance in writing Julia code. So let's start with looking at the compilation process. So it goes in several stages, and I'm going to take you through the, the various stages. The first part is called lowering. And that's done in most compilers and basically means we're taking the higher level features of programming language and we're turning that into more primitive uh, features. So if we're talking about a language like uh, C or C++, lowering would mean, for instance, changing higher level constructs like while loops or for loops into if statements with the go to's. And then for all of the various stages we're going through in the compilation process, we're generally creating uh, syntax trees in Julia that gets transformed or gets uh, data annotated to it. Before we get to the final stages, which is where we're generating uh, the low level virtual machine bit code. So that's almost like assembly code or machine code for a kind of abstract CPU. It's at a much lower level than something like the Python bytecode or the Java bytecode. So it's a, a short step from that into the actual native machine code. So we're going to start with looking at a simple example. So here to find a function called calculation where we're just doing some simple arithmetic with the arguments a, b, and c. So as you already know, we can give it different kinds of numbers, integers or floating point numbers. We don't have to write different methods for, for dealing with that. So look what happens when we're lowering, we're having these different macros that we can use. So we have a macro called ats code lowered. And we have to specify our arguments because the result is going to actually vary depending on the arguments. So here I highlight this where we're lowering is causing Julia to generate a lambda info object. And that contains some quoted code. Uh, that doesn't look very different in this simple case, but we're going to look at a bit more elaborate example where you will see that the lower code will be different. It's a bit more interesting to look at the typed code. So we get that by writing code typed. And we also, we have to specify what kind of arguments we're using. In this case, I'm specifying integers because it's going to give different results. So you don't have to look at this now. It's a bit hard to read here. Um, I'm going to show you later what that looks like. If we're using floating point values, we're going to get something slightly different. So let's look at the different cases. What you'll notice here is that we don't have generic add functions anymore. This is a type specific add we're adding integers and then we're sticking the values using the box function into a box that we're essentially labeling as a 64 bit integer and you can see the same with the multiplication it's a integer specific multiplication and julie has figured out by uh, looking at the flow data through calculation that is going to return a 64 bit integer if the inputs are 64 bit integers if you look at the floating point version, uh, Julie has added floating point specific arithmetic functions and has figured out that the result will be 64 bit floating points. 
from here on, we go to the generation of the LLVM or the low-level virtual machine code, which we can use the at code LLVM uh, macro to get. So here we're doing it for integers and for uh, floating point values. We can even do it for mixed arguments. So here we're having floating point and integers. Now this all look fairly similar, but you can notice that there are some differences. Uh, here we're having mul and uh, add instructions, where here there's fmul and fa, which is floating point multiply and floating point add. And when we're mixing, we have an extra step here, which is sign integer to floating point conversion instruction. So this is what our uh, integer version looks like. You don't really have to remember exactly how LLVM works, but it's okay to have a rough idea of, of how it works. This part shows that we're defining a function that returns a 64-bit integer, and this says that we have three arguments, and each one of them are 64-bit integers. This is a multiply, and this is very similar to assembly instruction. The difference with LLVM and regular assembly is that it's typed. So it specifies here that this operation is operating on 64-bit integers. And also the registers in the CPU, so that's where actually all the arithmetic happens. You can't do arithmetic with things residing in memory. You have to actually pull it into your CPU first. These will typically on a real processor or real machine code, it will have actual names, but here they're just given generic names like one, two, and so on. And these are numbered so that zero, um, one, and two are the first, second, and third arguments to the function. So here we're adding the third and the second arguments and we're storing the results in another register um, label three, and then we're reusing that register to add to the first uh, argument to the function before we return the results. And in the case of double, it looks very similar, but here LLVM is marking that is returning a double value and it's taking three double values as arguments and is using fmul rather than mul for uh, multiplying the numbers. Uh, other than that, it looks uh, very similar. This will then turn into machine code. Um, this is the multiply, and in this case we're not having these sort of abstracts registered, but we're actually, uh, this is x86 assembly code where we have the RDX and RSI registers that we're multiplying. And this is the add. This looks a bit funny because it actually means, uh, LEA means load effective address, so it's actually adding to addresses. But since addresses are really just integers, you, you can use that for an integer addition. For the floating point version, we use entirely different instruction. We're using the mul sd, which stands for multiply scalar double. And we even have to use different uh, registers. You can't use the same kind of register for floating point math. And the add sd uh, is for um, add scalar doubles. So what I think is interesting with uh, you just seeing this example is that you can't imagine that you can really get this any more efficient than this. This is very little machine code generated. If this was Python or Ruby, you would have a, a lot more instructions generated for this kind of operations. And this is uh, just as efficient as C code. So let's look at a bit more elaborate example uh, where you can more easily see how lowering works. This is kind of a simplified version of the sum function. We're taking some vector is as argument xs and then we're we're looping over it and and adding it up into a sum variable. You can see I put this macro inbounds here. It's not really that important. Really, the only reason I put it there is because I want to turn off bounds checking because that would mean extra code that would just add confusion. But normally, you are, you really just put it there for performance reasons. Um, so if you have some code you really need to be high performance and you're certain that you're accessing the array inbounds, um, then you can put it there. So this is what the lowered code looks like now. Uh, you can see how it's a lot more primitive kind of Julia code. Everything is a lot more explicit. We're 
for instance, for length, we're putting the module in front of it, main. And there are no higher level constructs like a while loop. Instead, this is essentially like an if statement with a go to. So we're checking if i is uh, less or equal to n, then we can continue. Otherwise, we go to the label 18, which gives us an early exit. Otherwise, uh, what follows is the loop itself. Uh, the end of the loop is is here where we're having a go to eight where we start over again at the loop. If you look at this code, you can see there is uh, really no mention of types here, no floating point or integers mentioned uh, anywhere. For the type code generation, uh, we get annotated with types. So Julie has figured out by looking at the flow data or uh, how the data flows through the various variables in the instructions uh, in the function it has figured out that the n is a 64-bit integer and it has figured out that uh, when we're calculating sum we're using an integer uh, which use integer add and the same goes for the index the lvm code we get in this case is a bit more elaborate uh, and i i put it into individual boxes here to show you more what the flow is, how the jumping around happens. So you can just pause this video to uh, look a bit more at the details. The first part here is get element pointer and you're going to see that every time you're working with some compound data structure uh, like vector where we have individual fields will be at some offset from the base address of the objects. If that doesn't make sense to you what I'm saying now, it doesn't really uh, matter. You don't really have to understand this part. Just have a simple idea. This is where we're loading the, uh, we're using the base address and we're loading into a register the length of the vector. And then we're comparing that length to uh, one uh, with this ICMP, which means an integer compare and SLT is assigned less than. Just telling you that to to get the idea that you can you can hear already here that it's very explicit we're saying explicitly that it's for signed and the comparison isn't just any comparison it's a signed comparison so things get very specific at the machine code level and after you've done that comparison it's doing a branch or a jump to either the l2 label which is an early exit here or we continue uh, to this label, which is down here, which does some initialization. And then this is a loop itself where we're adding up the, uh, the individual values in excess to some, incrementing the i and doing comparison of i to n. All this turns into this machine code. So you can see it's, it's quite small machine code. So Julia is quite efficient at generating this. I I put this into boxes so you can see a little bit easier what happens. So you're having this similar kind of uh, check to have potentially an early exit. Um, if not, it continues um, doing some initialization before we enter the main loop where we're adding up the individual elements in sum, incrementing i, and doing a check of i against n before we're looping back. And when we're done, we're jumping to the exit point so what i just want to show in this case is that we're going from human friendly code in julia and then we're going ever to a lower more primitive uh, level which is what lowering is and then uh, julia will try to figure out what the different types of our variables and expressions will be and use that to annotate uh, variables and expressions and and pick type specific functions and this is what helps to generate the final or the machine friendly code so we're going from human friendly to machine code friendly in multiple steps